everyone. Um, please be advised this meeting will be recorded and posted on the Council's YouTube channel. Please ensure you switch your microphone on before addressing the committee and remember to switch it off when you finish speaking. Um, first item is apologies. I've received none. Um, second, urgent business. There is none. Third, declarations of interest. Any declarations of interest? No. Nope. Um, fourth is the minutes from the last call-in. Are members happy for me to sign the minutes? I appreciate neither of you on the panel, but I will take that as a yes. Um, Great. So we are um, considering a call in today of a decision taken by Cabinet on the 24th of July. We have with us um, the Chair of Cabinet, Council Okereke, and the respective portfolio holder, Council Highland, and other members of the Cabinet are also in attendance. Um, I will first ask the signatories of the call-in to address the subcommittee, and then I'll ask the Cabinet member who may, may call on the support or assistance of the officers to respond. The signatories may then comment on the response that has been given, and if anyone else requests to speak, I will give them two minutes each, and after which I will ask the Cabinet member if she's got any comments on what has been said. Um, members of the subcommittee can ask questions at any time. Uh, tonight, um, so call-in subcommittees have three options available to them. So we can accept the decision allowing immediate implementation, we can send the decision back to the decision maker with comments for reconsideration, or we can refer the decision to full council if it's deemed contrary to the policy or budget frameworks, but our legal officer has confirmed that, that the decision does not contradict the, policy, the budget and policy frameworks as explained in the report, so we only have the first two options available to us this evening. So can I invite the signatories to the call-in to address the subcommittee? Um, who would like to go first? Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you so much for convening the meeting. I didn't realize when I came into the meeting that the distance between us uh, is all that much, so uh, I very much hope by the end of the meeting that uh, um, the, the tables may come more closer together, really. Uh, just want to begin by making a few general comments, and um, I begin by saying that uh, those of us involved in this call-in uh, don't underestimate the challenge facing the Council. Uh, no easy choices exist in relation to budget setting. Um, but, for instance, um, in terms of the background, um, I refer particularly to the original decision taken on the 17th of November 2008. Uh, the minutes of that meeting drew attention to a question uh, raised by um, the UNITE uh, Secretary. Uh, the response at the time was from the Director of Trading Services was, it was not intended there would be a two-tier workforce. The situation of the pension fund would need to be clarified, which would happen as part of further discussion. Uh, clearly, members have not been kept up to date on the gradual erosion in terms of terms and conditions uh, that we've identified. In an email dated the 15th of July um, of this year, the Director stated that, in principle, Sickness, annual leave and pension is not the same as in local authority with some added flexibility. Customers are not willing to pay the increased prices that would lead to increase in those benefits, including schools and community organisations. In some markets uh, are very price sensitive. I had the opportunity of visiting two schools recently uh, to talk to staff uh, involved in the school meal service and quite frankly, uh, I would encourage other members to uh, talk to them as they find themselves in an extraordinarily difficult position regarding their employment. Uh, the situ this situation as set out in the uh, Cabinet meeting um, of this year uh, was never the reason why the company was set up uh, in the first place. Uh, the Cabinet decision, in my view, places the Council in an embarrassing position. The Cabinet report highlights that pay harmonisation, single status, is a pressure. Well, of course it is, and it's a pressure across the Council. Uh, this can and should be staggered over a shorter timescale, uh, as we set out uh, in our suggestions uh, to this uh, scrutiny panel. It's important to recognise at this point that 58% of staff are now on differential paying conditions. Uh, lowest paid staff were transferred. The equal, equal pay process 
led to the lowest paid, predominantly women, now receiving less pay. The council leaves itself open to an equal pay claim. Not able to provide it, we're not able to provide additional information as, uh, as I was not able to get any information uh, on the 127 staff terms and conditions of employment recruited by our in-house agency for school meal service and transferred to uh, an organisation known as Chartwells. And it raises an interesting point. This is a council company, uh, and in this regard, uh, it is important to recognise uh, that we ought to have an opportunity to know exactly what's going on in this company. This principle uh, is reinforced by the Employment Rights Green Paper published by government recently. It sets, it sets out clearly the legal position which will apply once legislation is passed. Labour will use public procurement to support good work. Evidence shows that, in, evidence shows that in, insourcing delivers uh, better value for money as well as providing greater efficiency, transparency, accountability and opportunity to achieve wider goals such as fair treatment of workers. The government will end the presumption of in favour of outsourcing and oversee the biggest wave of insourcing uh, in the public sector uh, for a generation. So whatever happens here this evening, uh, the cabinet uh, uh, decision uh, will be uh, non-existent anyway because it will have to introduce the, the, um, the policy as set out by government uh, in the next 12 months, I believe, uh, which is the government timeline. Our obligation as councillors is about doing the right thing for those that elected us and those we employ. Values and principles apply in this matter. We believe the proposal made in our submission is right and appropriate. We cannot sit here in an ivory tower and believe we can ki ki kick the can down the road and leave it to a future administration to sort. We should do it now and Cabinet should think again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The question we all must ask ourselves is this. Do we agree that it's acceptable for a Labour-led council to allow council activities to be run at arm's length for a profit at the expense of workers' pay and conditions? Is it acceptable that the poorest paid workers, predominantly women, be permanently employed by arm's length companies when we have a chance to bring them in-house again where the necessity to earn a profit is eliminated? Is it unreasonable to call for a five-year transition? Yes, just a five-year transition to bring these functions back in-house. This is hardly a radical proposal. This period allows us to open the books for proper consideration of the costs to hold negotiations with the workers and their representatives and carry out a much more detailed analysis of the steps needed to be taken. And when we talk of costs, we must take into account the costs to the workers concerned. Insecure work with fewer benefits in terms of holiday, sick pay and pensions drives workers into poverty. And then who must step in to give assistance to those workers? Councils will be under pressure to help those struggling to make ends meet, thus creating a cost which would inevitably come out of a council budget. The report to Cabinet mentions pay harmonisation and single status as pressures. This really gives the game away. The 1997 single status agreement began to address decades of unequal pay, impacting cleaning and catering staff in particular. But Greenwich Council then dealt with the cost by setting up GS Plus and GSS. The report to Cabinet says that 58% of staff are now on new pay and conditions. Just to put this into perspective, cleaning and catering staff are among the lowest paid council workers. The impact of the trading company is that the lowest paid council workers were transferred out and now 58% of that workforce are on even lower pay and conditions. This has led to the lowest paid, predominantly women, 
now receiving even less pay and benefits. The report talks about the cost of pay harmonisation should services come into in-house. TUP, TUP law, means that workers are transferred based on their current pay and conditions. So this, there is not a, an immediate cost. The unions would, of course, make the demand for harmonisation upwards, but there is no reason why this could not be staggered. The only conclusion that can be reached in all of this is that the GS plus GSS model is maintained through poor pay and conditions. The council needed to at least accept this and not pretend that its stated missions are met. For example, safe and healthy learning for children is not helped when parents are working multiple jobs in order to earn a living. The irony is that because the company is wholly owned by the council, very recent legal cases mean it may not be immune from a claimant using RBG workers as comparators for an equal pay claim. Was this risk assessed? There is no mention of it in the Cabinet report. According to a new report released by the TUC, the Trade Unions Congress this week, across the country workers are missing out on an estimated two billion pounds worth of holiday pay. Some of those workers are right here in Greenwich, employed by Greenwich Council's arm length, arm's length companies. Others will only have the opportunity to contribute to the G plus pension scheme, not the RBG council scheme. A close scrutiny of the books will show that the employer contributions to this scheme are much lower than those of the RBG scheme. There is a disturbing lack of transparency about this whole proposal. There has been a lack of detailed analysis provided, so much so that councillors have found it virtually impossible to nail down the facts. Some of the excuses we've been given for not receiving additional information include the need for commercial confidentiality. Since when are workers' rights sacrificed at the altar of commercial confidentiality by a Labour-led council? We have been passed from pillar to post trying to locate an officer who is allowed to supply answers to detailed questions. I've not had, yet had an answer to the question, has any consultation with unions representing the affected workers been held before this decision was taken? Perhaps members of the scrutiny panel might have more luck getting that answer. We need to think again. The current trend is to bring council functions back in house. And as Councillor Fahi has said, this is exactly the direction of travel announced by the new Labour government. And legislation will be in force within the next six months. It can be done efficiently. And what is needed to make it happen is political will and leadership. One final thought. Let us not think this is a problem somewhere out there. In this building, we are all protected and helped by security and support workers every day we come through the door. When we are leaving this meeting tonight, will we be able to look at those work workers in the eye and say we did the best for them? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Do members have any questions for these signatories? Any questions for the signatories to the call-in now? Do you have any no. questions? No. Thank you. Um, I will now um, move on to, to Councillor Highland to respond to the call-in. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm obviously perturbed uh, that we've got hyperbolic language like ivory tower, kicking the can down the road, gives the game away, sacrificed at the altar, and so on and so forth. This is actually a formal decision of the, f the formal cabinet, and it was a unanimous decision, and it was based on all of the facts that you good people will have read in the report. Now, the reason that that these companies were started off back in the day 
was to try to keep as many people employed by the council in case of compulsive competitive tendering. And actually today, something like 97% of these people are employed either in Greenwich or in the neighboring boroughs. I was told as cabinet member that the staff were um, urgently wanting some certainty about their future and what was going to happen for them given the decision that had been taken in 2019 when the companies were struggling financially um, to bring, to insource the company. Now, I don't think you could put a cigarette paper between what Councillor Anning and Fahi want and what we would like in terms of the cost of living crisis, about making sure that women have got equal pay, making sure that there is prosperity in the residents and the workers in this borough. But the facts are there before you, that if we were to try to insource this company, actually it would cost upwards of two million a year, every year. And we just don't have the funding. The people that are working in that company, wanting certainty, and we have given it to them in this decision. There is nothing to stop in the next 10 years for the company to choose a direction of travel that could include a co-op, it could, it could be a management buyout, it could be in sourcing, it could be anything. It, the flexibility is still there. What we have said is that we will take a strategic partnership agreement for 10 years with GS Plus. No one in 2019 knew about COVID and no one knows what's around the corner now. We have to look and take a decision at the time with a 360 degree, degree appraisal and we feel that that has been done. And the truth of it is, is yes, there is commercial, um, there is commercial sensitivity around some of those contracts. We as councillors see it usually on pink papers, don't we? That's just a fact of life. And new councillors need to get used to that idea that we are actually a corporation, we're a corporate being, we're corporate parents, we're also corporate shareholders. This is not about profit, this is about giving people prosperity, making sure there is work. If we were to insource now, all of Gateway would go, we wouldn't be able to run a recruitment agency, we would not be able to run an MOT station, and so on and so forth. We just wouldn't be able to get the grants and the subsidies that the company can get if it was insourced. But more than anything, financially, I'm afraid we have to be, some of us have to be realistic and know that, you know, we'd love jam today and jam tomorrow, but it can't always happen in the here and the now. We have to be, um, pragmatic and I swear to you that is what we are being there is no philosophy running this it is purely around practical sense of what how the companies can go forward and I ask you as a panel please accept the decision that's been made and let's move forward with GS plus in a very positive and meaningful way where dialogue can take place about what sort of future the companies may have, or even about insourcing, but it's not the right time here and now. And, and, and Chair, if I'd be so, um, you know, cheeky to ask it if it's possible for, for the leader, if he would like to come in to do so, thank you. Of course, Councillor Okareki, is there anything you, you want to much. say? Thank you very much, uh, Denise, and thank you very much, Sharon, uh, and the panel. I also want to thank um, 
Councillor Fahi uh, and Councillor Anning for their contributions today. Chair, I think the report um, sets out the way forward uh, and quite comfortably um, Cabinet voted unanimously to take up that position. Uh, this is more about actually protecting uh, uh, the workers of, of GS Plus. Um, and the decision we t took today does that. It has implications if we uh, bring it in-house, and obviously we know where the council is financially, which is well uh, documented in uh, the report. Uh, 4.7 speaks to the point about, uh, uh, about where surplus goes back to the council uh, and articulates that. So it's, it's not really about focusing and up, uh, uh, increasing profits and all of that kind of stuff. Lastly, none of our council staff are... Are, are you know are, are mm -hmm. on all of our council staff are on different pensions they have different salaries they have different access to leave that's the same with any other organization that you'll go to uh, simply saying that we all need one thing one one way for everyone it, it, it's un, it, that, that's not the case of the nature of how the world works um, so I think you know the very objective they seek to achieve it probably wouldn't deliver that uh, specific objective um, and I think that's all I need to say on, on that matter. Um, so we're quite comfortable with the decision. Um, in terms of transparency, um, there was an issue raised about transparency. Now, obviously, uh, uh, I see in um, the uh, calling uh, notice, it speaks to the points of the auditor, but it fails to take into account the further comments of the auditor that says, GSS and GS on 4.10, GSS and GSP have been in operation for a significant number of years and transparency is embedded in the council's approach to both companies. And if you see paragraph 4.2, that sets out the reporting mechanism uh, uh, on the governance around how we uh, work in collaboration with, with, um, with the company. Obviously, we have the member working group. There's an annual report to scrutiny uh, that happens all the time, which members have the ability to scrutinize uh, our, our interactions with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, do any members of the panel have questions for the cabinet member? Councillor Hartley. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, thank you to the two colleagues who've called this in. Um, I completely agree with everything Councillor Highland and Councillor Okarake have said. Um, I just wondered on that transparency point, given the auditor's comment, um, something that's been raised before on audit and risk management and um, through the scrutiny um, system is the uh, misalignment in timing and the a potential opportunity for the accounts of both subsidiary companies to be um, put through the same uh, level of scrutiny as the council's own accounts and that's not currently the, the case um, and that might be a way of showing a practical suggestion of demonstrating actually that the the uh, the risk that uh, that a lack of transparency may be a risk which is what the auditor said and the word may was was key in that um, that is one suggestion that might just show to um, members of the public and all kind of stakeholders that actually the council continues to be committed to transparency um, but I, I agree with everything that's been said and, and that's just the one suggestion I would make on on that final point Councillor Mbang Thanks, um, Councillor Denise, for, and then um, Councillor Kerike for your presentations. And I also want to thank Councillor um, Anink and also John Fahey for bringing this case forward. Um, I think um, the, the aspect of protecting the staff, the flexibility, the certainty is absolutely um, the right direction. Um, but I think what is also very important is um, the conditions of service that um, has been mentioned in the, uh, by our colleagues from the, um, the call-in, um, conditions of service about pay, about sickness, and about pension. Um, I, would like, um, I would like a comment about that, whether consideration was made about um, that particular area where we, we know for sure that um, these, uh, these people sometimes, the pension is not it's not anything that really is very helpful. Um, when I say not helpful, the pension is not that much. And then we also have a situation where um, there's certainty, but then the question is, um, we know majority of these people who work as mentioned, um, they struggle to do other jobs, and they end up really not even getting ends meet 
and we know we've met or we've seen some of them in food banks and whatnot. So the aspect of the union shouldn't have, whether the union were, taking, uh, were, were asked to take part uh, or more or less were they consulted on their behalf is one thing I want, if you can comment on that, please. Thank you. Well, to, to be honest, um, I have attended all the union meetings since I have become cabinet member, and we've talked about many issues, but GS Plus and GSS has not been raised with me by, by any of the unions that I have encountered. Uh, what has been said to me is that the staff need certainty about their futures. And we know, don't we, that there would be redundancies if we were to try and insource GS Plus and GSS. There would be redundancies, for example, in HR, in finance, um, the school meal service, Chartwells wouldn't get the staff, the local staff, because the recruitment agency wouldn't exist. And lastly, um, there are the MOT station, about eight fleet staff would have to be made redundant. And we'd deprive ourselves of all the subsidies that the companies can, can apply for now. I take your point about pensions, and it's a point that I raised when I first came in as a cabinet member about a discrepancy between GS Plus and GSS and RBG in terms of the employer. I don't think there is really a discrepancy about how much the employee puts in, but there is in terms of the employer, and I would like to see that increased. And now that the company, company unlike in 2019, now that they are beginning to make a profit, then actually that is something I would hope that the managing director and the board would look at, because that is not a council decision, that would have to be the company's decision. Um, obviously, it has been raised with me um, by the unions, uh, and I believe I gave a response uh, on the same points that are raised in this report, and the unions were satisfied with that response at the time, and that was uh, 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 when I engaged with them last on it. Now, I think it's quite evident, you see who's in this room today, uh, the unions on here. Um, I don't think this is a pressing matter for them, um, so I think they're satisfied with the council's position. Thank you. Um, do the signatories to the call and have any comment on what they have just heard, but I would ask that you stick to the, the terms of the call-in, so that's the perpetuation of the two-tier workforce and the transparency and accountability points. Do either of you have any, any further comments you want to make on the Cabinet member's response? Well, I'm grateful to uh, Councillor Highland and Okoreki for their comments, and um, I think Councillor Highland is right. It's, um, there isn't a, a fact paper between us, really, but I think there is an issue about timing. And I, I, I just feel anxious uh, that here we have uh, the Employment Rights Green Paper uh, produced by government, which sets out very clearly uh, that insourcing will happen. It's not going to happen in 10 years' time. Uh, it's going to happen within the lifetime of this administration, which is exactly the point we were making about the five years. Clearly there are issues about how we can phase in the, uh, the, the, um, the staff uh, in a proactive way, but waiting 10 years is likely to cost a lot more in terms of insourcing than it's likely to cost now. And in effect, um, I firmly believe that the, that the cabinet have got this wrong uh, that had they had the opportunity of looking at the matter in more detail, um, it would actually be uh, a more helpful position uh, to accept the proposal of five years uh, rather than ten. Um, nobody is, there's nothing in the cabinet paper uh, at all uh, about the government, government response uh, to insourcing and um, employment rights. And clearly, in this situation, the employment rights uh, at GS Plus are not appropriate and should be dealt with. Um, and 
um, as, as councillors, we do have an opportunity and, a, and an obligation to ensure that the workforce we employ, and we can't simply say, uh, on the one hand, uh, they're GS plus, so they're out there, and on the other hand, say, well, they're a council company, because in actual fact, the chair uh, of the company uh, is appointed by the council, um, and therefore, uh, the council has clear duties, which in this case, it hasn't applied. Um, thank you, Councillor Anning. Thank you, Chair. Of course, we understand that if you did this uh, insourcing overnight, there would be immense confusion. I'm not sure why this was even brought up. The uh, call-in is calling for a five-year transition. A five-year transition. There are many clever people in this council, many clever uh, officers and councillors who are absolutely adequate at drawing up a staged, sensible insourcing proposal for a five over a five year period. And it would be good if the unions were specifically asked for their proposals on this, because I'm not sure how long ago the leader did speak to the unions. But I do know one major union who only three days ago is uh, opposed to this move and very concerned. So it's, it's a bit of a mystery to me um, why we're talking about job losses when we are talking about a five-year transitional period. It's the direction of travel. It's the political direction of travel which, as Councillor Fahi has said, is a national, now a national priority. And we have not seen the costs that have been estimated in the report detailed in minute detail. We have not seen that. We have seen general costs mentioned and not on the basis of a five-year transitional period. This is what we think should be the right thing to do, and I cannot see why there is any reason why <clears throat> anyone on this panel should oppose that. Thank you. Um, is there a response to that from Councillor Okay, Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair. And just to note that, obviously, the, uh, uh, the paper that uh, uh, Councillor Fahi referenced obviously was a Labour Party uh, paper rather than the government one um, and not released by the government but do you want to note that it does say there they will end a presumption in favor of outsourcing uh, doesn't mean that they will um, end outsourcing uh, lots you know there's, there's uh, and, and, and that's one point and also in this we're not necessarily suggesting uh, that there is an opportunity to review it there is uh, so quite agree with Councillor Anning's uh, points about the point about looking at it and thinking about a plan. That's why we set that out. The company does need stability and that's why we've chosen that time frame. Lastly, I'll just add the final point um, about the unions. I, I believe they were invited uh, to um, GS, uh, GS Plus meeting in July uh, in regards to the decision. Thank you. Chair, I'm quite happy to uh, let Councillor Okariki have a copy of my uh, employment rights paper. It's a government decision. Um, thank you, Councillor Fahi. Um, just one question from me. Can I, um, can I understand the thought process behind a 10-year um, strategic agreement rather than a five-year agreement? What made you land on 10 years? Thank you. Uh, basically, as part of that 360-degree appraisal that we spoke about, um, the company need to go out there in the market and get contracts and so the market needs to know that there's certainty in dealing with those companies. But also the staff need to know that not every time the wind change changes does the council blow this way and that way. And so it was really about stability. You and I know that if you were, for example, to plan a cooperative venture, I mean... There are many different de definitions of a co-op. You could even consider the company at the moment to be a co-op. But 
What I'm saying is, if you were to take a John Lewis model, for example, just one example, you need time to work those kind of things up. And to be honest, there's a lot else going on for those companies. <laughs> the everyday work, the everyday job, such as taking special needs children to school, such as serving their meals, such as cleaning the schools, such as MOTing a fleet, such as running the council's fleet. There's an everyday job to be done alongside the strategic. And so 10 years was thought to give them that stability that they need. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to um, invite anyone else in attendance who registered to speak to address the subcommittee. I've only had one person register, and that's Councillor David Gardner. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, so I... Uh, you know, originally was a signatory uh, to the call-in, uh, but I withdrew my name uh, because I was anxious seeing all sides of this. I was very anxious that we uh, try and reach a conclusion uh, because as both the, um, the signatories and the cabinet member has said, there is nothing really between us. Um, so my, my sense is a pragmatic one. We all recognize that GS Plus do do a tremendous job the staff in GS Plus work really, really hard. We see them day in, day out, driving those buses with people with adults and children with, with, with special needs, uh, working downstairs and obviously cleaning uh, schools. Sadly, we lost catering and I think that was ba done badly and a lesson there, but we're not here to discuss that. Um, so everyone accepts that we need to keep up the quality and the performance of the service and clearly we need to deliver value for money. And I think where I was looking, Chair, uh, for a bit of a nod uh, was firstly that there should be a five-year review point um, and uh, I, I think that would be uh, very um, timely um, and originally the original decision to bring it in house was 2019 and we're now 2024. Uh, sadly, there doesn't seem to have ever been a, a business plan to bring it in-house. Uh, so we slipped, firstly with a pandemic, and then no business plan afterwards to bring it in-house. Um, so I think five-year review would be timely. We'll know where we'll be with new legislation and so forth at that point, and hopefully we'll be in a much better financial position as an authority. Uh, and secondly, that the strategic partnership agreement should be published Originally in 2008, we were committed to transparency. Uh, it should be published and it should be subject to uh, scrutiny, uh, ideally pre-decision scrutiny, but it should be scrutinized as this 10-year strategic partnership agreement. Um, so I do think there is room uh, for some movement, Chair, uh, but I do fully understand the financial pressures on the Council um, and that um, you know, money is really really tight at the moment. I don't necessarily accept the two million pounds figure. I think a lot of that is, could be contested, um, but clearly there would be a cost to the council and clearly this needs to be looked at in the round and there needs to be a process of moving towards that, uh, towards moving in house and with GSS perhaps as a cooperative. Um, I'm not sure it's necessarily a core business of the council to run an employment agency. Um, but. I just wanted to quote from the audit letter, um, which is on page 37 of the 22-23 audit letter, which was published before Council in April. Uh, and the use of Council-owned companies um, may increase the risk of a lack of transparency and conflicts of interest. I think that's really important, that second point as well. It would be timely for the Council to undertake a review of council companies to ensure they are delivering value for money against their original business uh, plans and to ensure that monitoring arrangements can continue to be effective for protecting the council's investment in future. And I think that's something. And then Councillor Fahey referred to a green paper. Well, the green paper I found is on the 24th of May 2024, which was published by the Labour Party, but has been uh, reasserted today at the TUC conference by the Prime Minister. 
and that was very clear on this particular issue. It said, we will also reinstate and strengthen the last Labour government's two-tier code to end unfair two-tiered workforces, the scope of um, the, the scope of the two-tier code and the public interest test, which I could explain, uh, will apply to wholly owned subsidiary companies. So under that green paper, we'd no longer be able to have this huge difference in pension arrangements and terms and conditions for staff that, that were legacy, um, the 42% that were legacy staff and, and still have council, and the 58% and increasing, obviously, uh, that only have 3% employer contribution to their pension. Um, so I, I do think that's really important. I do think that does trigger really a five-year uh, review and hope we can move, uh, Chair, in that direction. But at the same time, I fully understand the, um, the, the uh, position that the Council and GS Plus are in and uh, the, need to, um, the need to provide some certainty as well. Um, so those are the comments I'd you know, like to make and just hope they are um, helpful. And, and those two comments about the partnership agreement <coughs> coming to scrutiny and a review in five years with all options on the table, including in sourcing and uh, a cooperative uh, solution for GSS, um, that those should be taken into account by the, um, uh, by, by the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Um, I'm conscious this was a full cabinet decision and we have a lot of cabinet members here. Was anyone hoping to speak? Uh, Chair, we'll, we'll, we came to speak on behalf of the cabinet. Thank you. Thank you. Does the, the councillor Denise Highland, do you have anything you want to say as a result of um, any other comments made tonight? I mean, I, I think I thank um, councillor Gardner for his uh, contributions and obviously we've had to have a lot of conversations ourselves and obviously um, you've taken your position. I think that's quite helpful and we look forward to continue having those kind of discussions. I think, you know, we've described here that this is very much about a journey uh, and uh, uh, our, our decision doesn't preclude that journey. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so I have been advised by a legal officer that the decision isn't contrary to the policy framework or budget. So we have two options here tonight. As mentioned earlier, we can note the decision and take no further action, or we can refer the decision to cabinet as a decision maker for reconsideration. Um, do you have any thoughts, committee? Um, I'm happy to, to go with option one. I'm satisfied with what I've heard from the cabinet member um, for finance. And just, just because it, it came up after I last spoke, this issue around the uh, timing of government, the new government's intention around this document that was published, I think what I've heard and my understanding is, uh, which has been confirmed tonight, is that uh, nothing in this decision precludes a change in approach should that Labour Party document actually become a government document because anybody can publish anything and call it a green paper until it's actually government policy and legislation it it's not it you know you can't run a council based on 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 a political document like that so my understanding has been confirmed tonight that nothing in this decision precludes a change in approach if that is necessary because of uh, future government action so i just wanted to check that you know that was any, any kind of remaining doubt in my mind has been satisfied by that point Thank you. Councillor Mbang? Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, I think um, I'm also of the view that yes, um, <clears throat> option one is absolutely the way forward, but then I also strongly believe that um, the review um, within the five years is very, very important because what is also clear is um, we didn't know about COVID. When COVID came, everything changed. So we never know what is going to happen in this, the years to come. And the fact that um, it has been highlighted about pension and working conditions not being that brilliant, I believe that a review at some point should be taken into consideration rather than just put it. Um, of course, it is 10 years, which is a good thing for business to, to flourish, for that matter. And you've just mentioned that they are doing well and they might possibly do something about the, the conditions of service. But I think that uh, the the chance to review is also very, very important. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bang. Um, just to be clear, if you're going for option one... That's right, but, but to, to, to... Yes. We, we do option one without comment, so I'm sure the Cabinet member will take it on board, but it won't be a specific comment from 
from tonight's proceedings. I'm happy, I'm happy to do that, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I also agree. I think um, we will be going with option one. I think the terms of the call-in have been adequately addressed both in the report, um, and I don't think referring it back with comments would change the decision made because everything had been taken into account. Um, thank you all very much for your contributions tonight. Uh, this concludes the meeting.